Chapter 11, Biodiversity and Conservation Biology. The first sticky notes are on page 276. Know the definition of biodiversity, which is all the different number of species that live in an area. Also know the definition of species. Basically, if you can mate and you do it in the wild, you are the same species. There are different kinds of biodiversity. We have ecosystem, species, and genetic diversity. So know all three of those terms. Also understand that genetic diversity is important because it allows a population to withstand environmental change. So what that means is if it gets hotter or colder or more dry, some in that species some of these frogs or some of those birds might have the genes to withstand a difference in moisture or temperature. And so the rest will die out, but those will live, and then your species doesn't go extinct. Make sure you know on this page, it's not a sticky note, but know that insects make up the majority of the species on the planet. Okay, page 280, make sure you know this caption and figure about latitudinal gradient. So latitudinal gradient basically refers to as you're close to the equator, you, which is more um, moisture and hotter temperatures, you have more species. And then as you go closer to the poles, you get less and less and less different kinds of species. This doesn't mean less animals and plants, it just means less different kinds, which is your biodiversity. There are some exceptions. So these are a generality, um, but we do have some biodiversity hotspots like in here and right here and here. But the general trend is that you, as you go from the equator to the poles, you're going to decrease in biodiversity. On the next page, 281, know the definition of extinction and extirpation. So extirpation is basically where an, a species is gone from a certain portion of its range. It's extirpated. So for example, we can say the grizzly bear has been extirpated from California. So we no longer have grizzlies in California. Background rate of extinction. So we normally have species go extinct. That's a normal rate. That's called the background rate. Species have been going extinct for thousands and millions of years. So we have um, that background rate, but it's increasing because of human activities higher than what should normally be happening. In the past, we have had five previous mass extinctions, and we're in the middle of the sixth. That is human caused. So you need to know that the sixth is human caused. The um, two previous mass extinctions that you need to know, you need to know that the Permo-Triassic was the largest mass extinction, and that's the third one on the list. And you need to know that the Cretaceous involved the dinosaurs. And that was actually the fifth one. All right, some famous extinctions. Oh, uh, by the way, the rest of this list, you don't need to know. These are just the two pieces of information you need to know. Famous extinctions, the passenger pigeon used to be numerous and then we um, hunted them. They, we know now that the passenger pigeon naturally goes through declines in populations and increase. The problem is, is that it was going through a natural decline um, as it was being hunted by humans. So it was kind of a combination of the two. I think if humans knew um, as they were hunting them for food, that they were also going to be declining. Um, I don't think we, that they would be extinct, but they kind of happened at the same time. The Carolina parakeet is another famous one, and the great auk and the dodo bird. So know those famous extinctions. Um, the IUCN red list is a list of the species facing the highest ring, rates of extinction. Um, highest risk of extinction. So make sure you know that on 283. 284, these are our causes of habitat loss. Number one is, I'm sorry, the causes of species going extinct or becoming endangered. 
And number one is habitat loss. So you have to know that this is the first cause of species going extinct or becoming endangered. And there are different types of habitat loss. Um, deforestation, development. We can also have habitat fragmentation here where you don't get rid of all of the habitat but enough to make some species that need bigger ranges go extinct. We see this a lot in Santa Clarita when we take down some of the hills in Chaparral and build houses here and houses there and we leave little patches of wilderness and intact chaparral in between our housing developments. Page 285, you need to know um, some information about top predators. They're often, but not always, keystone species. They are frequently hunted. They need large areas of habitat and they're vulnerable to a buildup of toxins in their system through biomagnification. And we'll study this later in chapter 14. Um, we see this actually around Santa Clarita um, Southern California, in the LA area, we're having trouble with our mountain lions because they're eating rats that people have killed with rat poison, and the rat poison is building up in the mountain lion's body and killing them. You know, this figure in caption, so elephants are in serious trouble because of the ivory trade. So, um, they anticipate some, some scientists think that they may go extinct in the wild within the next couple of decades due to this. And a lot of this is financing actually the civil wars and genocides in, in Africa. It's how they get their money to buy weapons and arms. All right, on page 288, we have invasive species. No two or three of them. Um, the gypsy moth is pretty famous in the United States. There's been an FRQ um, with this as a scenario before. Um, the starling, we see those actually in Santa Clarita. They migrate through, and they're very aggressive, and they outcompete the native birds, but they're not here all the time. Kudzu is a vine in the eastern United States. I used to see it when I lived in North Carolina, it would cover the entire forest and it's, it basically blocks the light so that those trees can't photosynthesize. All right, um, the figure in caption here shows that amphibians are declining worldwide and this is pretty frightening um, because amphibians are indicator species. We'll talk about that in a second. On the next page here on 290, it talks about the reason why high, diversity, high biodiversity is really important for ecosystems. The more different kinds of species that you have, the more stability and resilience. So if you have some sort of change that happens, a fire that goes through, a flood, global warming, habitat loss, some species will remain. Now some may be lost, but some will remain. And so the more different kinds you have, the more your ecosystem will remain stable and become resilient or and be resilient. So there are a lot of ecosystem services for biodiversity as well. Remember that ecosystem service is something that nature provides us that we need for survival or to make money. And so the more biodiversity that we can preserve is the better it is. So Biodiversity, we can have all kinds of fuels and fibers and shelters, not just from wood, but from other products too. Um, the trees and the plants purify the air and the water. We stabilize the Earth's climate. We moderate floods. So make sure that you can um, write about three to four of these on an FRQ. All right, so let's talk about biological indicators. And these are important because they tell us the health of an ecosystem or if something is about ready to happen and so your ecosystem will decline. Birds are really good because they're, birds are really mostly generalists. There are some exceptions like owls are specialists, but really most of them are generalists and they can kind of eat anything and live anywhere. And so when they start to disappear, you know there's a problem. 
Another indicator is amphibians because they live on land and water and they absorb toxins through their skin. So they're an indicator of pollution on land or um, too much heat or too much light or other kind of environmental stresses, maybe from deforestation, global warming, drought, or pollution and toxins in the air and water. All right, go all the way to page 296. So the provisions of the Endangered Species Act basically says you can't destroy an endangered species, you can't hunt them, you can't kill them, even by accident. Well, if it's by accident, you can sometimes get away with it, but you have to really prove that it's by accident. Um, you also can't destroy their habitat, so you can't take away their homes, because basically that kills them if you take away their home. You also can't trade in, in endangered species parts, so um, bear gallbladders are often traded, um, elephant tusks, rhinoceros horns, um, animal furs from endangered species, so it's illegal to trade, buy and sell those parts. So. Um, Make sure you don't do that. There is some opposition to the Endangered Species Act here. Um, in this paragraph, starting with polls repeatedly show that most Americans support protecting endangered species. There is some opposition in terms of protecting jobs, like in the Pacific Northwest with the spotted owl. In the US, in California, sorry, we have some opposition to protecting some species with our drought. There's a species in the Sacramento River Delta that we pump water out of into our aqueducts. It's called the Delta Smelt. It's a little fish and we have to reduce pumping for agriculture in cities to protect the fish. And so some people think that that is a foolish thing to do in a drought. All right, on page 297, know the provision of sites. So sites is similar to the Endangered Species Act, except that it is an international treaty and basically it says you cannot buy and trade endangered species parts. So this prevents international trade of elephant tusks and rhinoceros horns and animal pelts and things like that. Know uh, what the Convention of Biological Diversity is and was. Know what captive breeding programs are. We have them here and there. In Santa Clarita, we have one really close by. It's the Gibbons Preserve they breed endangered gibbons, which are a type of monkey, over off of Bouquet Canyon Road. So we have one pretty close by. Page 298. We talked earlier this year about wolf reintroduction in Yellowstone. There was some opposition. So we had some really important ecological goals, but there was some opposition too from ranchers. Um, and fearing for their livestock, so make sure you know a little bit about that. Also know how forensics can help protect species. So basically, if there's some meat being sold in a market in Japan, we have investigators that have gone in and done DNA analysis. If they said it was some other animal, but it actually ends up being whales, then we can help, we can prosecute that or understand what's going on even. Um, we can tell through DNA analysis if somebody has caught a protected species in Africa, which um, any wild animal in Africa we call bushmeat, and we can use DNA forensics evidence to see if um, it really is an endangered species that they caught and not just um, a goat or uh, you know cattle or something like that. On the next page, do you know the definition of forensics? An umbrella species, flagship species, and then hot spot. We're actually in a hot spot in Southern California. We have um, a lot of biodiversity here because of all the different kinds of microhabitats we have, from mountains to the deserts to the oceans. So we are in a biodiversity hot spot in LA County and San Diego County. And then ecological restoration seeks to restore some places that are degraded. And that's it for chapter 11.